so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. This episode contains graphic depictions of violent crimes. Listener discretion is advised. It's the 20th of June, 1994, and the residents of Anderson's Bay in Dunedin are waking up to a crisp, dark morning. Ice frosts the roads, and despite it being after seven o'clock, the sun is still yet to appear in the sky. Three police officers stand alert on the doorstep of 65 Every Street, a ramshackle house home to the six members of the Bain family. 11 minutes earlier, a distressed call was made to emergency services from this location. The officers try to gain access to the house. They kick the door, but it doesn't budge. Luckily, there's a stack of firewood on the veranda. They grab a piece and use it to break the glass pane, reaching through to let themselves inside. As they enter, they see a man on the floor in the fetal position. He's crying. And as they inch closer, he starts yelling, they're all dead. My family is all dead. What they find in that house will haunt New Zealand and stump investigators to this day and will become the most controversial case New Zealand has ever seen. I'm Gia Moylan and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. Today's episode is about the Bain family, five members of which were found dead in their home in the early hours of June 20, 1994. Talking us through the case is New Zealand journalist and writer Martin Van Bainen. Martin's book, Black Hands, and his podcast of the same name, thoroughly outlines the Bain family's history, the events of that day, and the evidence left behind. Martin, I wanted to start by asking, what do we know about the Bain family's history? Margaret and Robin Bain, the parents. In about 1974, the couple, who then had only David as a child, I think he was two years old, they decided to do some sort of missionary work in Papua New Guinea. So David was born in Dunedin, and the other three children, the oldest apart from David, was Arawa. She was 19 when she died. Then there was Laniat, who was 18, and Stephen, who was 14 at the time of his death. So they were all born in Papua New Guinea, Arawa, very, very soon after they arrived. So they had most of their schooling, or a lot of their schooling in Papua New Guinea. They were homeschooled by Margaret, and they also went to an international school when the family moved to Port Moresby. Initially, they worked on an island called New Britain, in a very remote spot where there was sort of a teacher's boarding college of which Robin was the deputy principal. So that was the idea that Robin, with his teaching experience, would teach the locals how to be good teachers. So they spent, I think, five or six years on New Britain, and then they moved to Port Moresby, where Robin actually got a position with the teacher's college there and was a lecturer. So he lived on the school compound and was treated with great respect, as a lot of those expats were at the time. This was just before Papua New Guinea or around the time of Papua New Guinea's Declaration of Independence. So there was a move to move locals into these positions, and that may have affected Robin's career prospects in Papua New Guinea. And what was the family dynamic like? It's hard to say. It depends a bit on who you read and who you talk to. Some people that I've spoken to or have read about believe the family was a lovely, close unified unit where Margaret was sort of an earth mother and Robin was a lovely gentle man and the children were all having a wonderful time in the outdoors in Papua New Guinea. But others saw a very dysfunctional family 
Margaret was very dominating. Robin was reticent and didn't seem to stick up for himself or just took the easy road because it was less trouble. The children, from what you hear, were left pretty much to their own devices. David was left to look after the kids a lot. He was very close to his mother and their domestic situation was chaotic and disgustingly dirty, really. And even though some saw the family as being like a sort of a happy family with different values, others saw them as really dysfunctional, lazy, and lacking responsibility for the children. There are lots of stories told about how people wouldn't want to have a cup of tea at the Bain household because it was so dirty or wouldn't go to dinner there. Margaret certainly adopted some of the local health practices and spiritual beliefs. So by the time they left Papua New Guinea, which was in 1988, so they were in Papua New Guinea from 1974 to 1988. So they've been there a long time, a lot longer than most expats would stick around. And by the time they left, the family seemed to be in a fairly bad way. And Margaret had actually gone to a psychologist she knew who was also teaching at the teacher's college and asked her to sort of help her with the family. And this woman was reluctant to do that, but she said, well, I'll talk to everybody and let you know how it all goes. So she spoke to everyone in the family and she became very concerned for them. She thought Margaret was completely domineering. Robin was a shadow of a man. She was impressed with David. She thought that Stephen was basically left to run wild. She thought Arawa was desperate for some sort of routine and a school life and a normal life. So she reported that the family, when they went back to Dunedin, should see not just one counsellor, but a number of counsellors to deal with what she saw was the family dysfunction. Do we know if they did? There's no evidence they did talk to a professional in that family area. That's not to say that Margaret didn't tell people about issues she was having, but there wasn't any professional guidance sought or they didn't report problems with the family to their GP or anything like that. So the family moved back to Dunedin. Did they settle in okay after all that time away? Yes, so they get back to Dunedin and David and Arwa and Lani start at the local high school. And Arwa thrives. She does really well. She has a big group of friends. Everyone likes her. And David struggles. And so does Laniette, for that matter. Laniette, according to some reports, could hardly read when she returned from Papua New Guinea and wasn't very academic anyway. David, probably because he had been homeschooled and had some pretty big gaps in his education, didn't do very well either. So the family were in this, rattling around in this huge house which was falling around them. The conditions were pretty squalid. Big place. It was built in 1855, I think it was. It was a very old, grand home that was in complete disrepair by the time the Baines bought it. And it just got worse because they didn't do any maintenance. And the idea was the house would be demolished and they would then build their own sort of modern dwelling on the place, along with the beautiful vegetable garden and all that sort of thing. So they had big plans for that area. So they kept on hanging everything on this new house, and it looks as though Robin and Margaret had quite different ideas about what that would be. So Margaret had the idea that it would be some sort of refuge, some sort of centre for people to come and sort of retreat from life and get their act together. The family would all have their own room and who knows, you know, what she thought the future would hold for the family. But I think she wanted to get everyone together in this house. The big question though was whether she wanted Robin there. Because the marriage was falling apart even before they came to Dunedin. Robin and Margaret we had a very rocky relationship. Partly I think because Margaret seemed to think that Robin was possessed by the devil. So this is another whole aspect. In fact, she thought the whole family might be infected by the devil, but she was particularly hard on Robin. 
So she didn't like Robin's influence in the, the house. So in the end, to cut a long story short, Robin ended up living in a caravan at the back of the house. So he wasn't allowed to sleep in the house. He had to sleep in the caravan. I'm not sure he minded about that, although it was pretty cold and bleak out there. But anyway, he was banned. He was banished from the house by Margaret. Where had those beliefs come from? Well, she sort of had a grab bag of beliefs that she got from New Age philosophy, her own fairly strict Presbyterianism. They were also Quakers. So in terms of the devil, I don't really know. But she developed a very strong sense that not only that that she might have been affected by some sort of devil spirit, which she also saw in the rest of the family at times, especially Robin. And she would give them marks out of 10 or she would put them on a ladder and she would be at the top, the least devil influenced. And then there'd be David and Arua and Laniat and Robin would be right at the bottom. She thought she had a direct line with God. So she thought, and we get this from her diaries, she believed that God would guide her that she believed she was hearing messages from God to build the refuge. She had a message from God that David was to do the building and Arava was to do something else. So she really did think that God had a very strong presence in their lives and was guiding them. Let's now go to Monday, June 20, 1994. It's the early hours of the morning and emergency services receive a call from David Bain the eldest of the Bain children, as you mentioned. What did he say? Well, we know exactly what he said because we have the recording and it's been played in court and played numerous times. Essentially, he said that he'd come home and his family were all dead. He sounded very distressed, very frightened, and when he's asked, whereabouts are you, he said, every street, 65 every street. My family, they're all dead. Hurry up. What was interesting about the phone call, as the uh, call taker said later, was how David was able to, you know, give the details, like his phone number and the address so clearly, given the extreme trauma that he must have been under. And when they do arrive on the scene, what situation is in front of them? The situation they find is a very dark pathway leading up to the front of the house and they can see one light and the light shows a person sitting on the floor of a room which is turns out to be David and they also look through another window and they can see a hand stretched out on the floor with a gun so they approach the person who's sitting in the room with the light on and try and get him to open the door But this doesn't work, so they have to smash a pane in the door and open it from the inside. And then they go in, and they find themselves in a hallway. On the left is David, the 22-year-old student, paper boy, who had called them only about 10, 15 minutes ago. He's still very distressed. He's wailing. He's crying. So they send one police officer to look after him. And then they have to go down the hallway to check all the other rooms because they need to find out how many other bodies are in the house. But they also have to make sure that the killer's no longer there. So they had their police revolvers, their torches, and they went down the hallway. And they go, first of all, into Margaret's room. And they find her lying on her waterbed with a bullet through her eyebrow of her left eye. And then they go across the hallway and they find the body of Laniette. This is the 18-year-old. They then proceed down the stairs. And then they turn right into Arwa Bain's bedroom. And they also find her dead. So this is pretty awful, as you can imagine. But David has already told the police that there are six people in the house. So they've found David and they've found three bodies. The other officer has found Robin Bain. So Robin is found in the room opposite David. And because there was a light on in David's room, the light shone into 
the room where Robin was, which is sort of the lounge. So that's how the police were able to see Robin's hand and the rifle from the outside. But anyway, so we have Robin found. We've got Margaret, Arla, and Lani. His body has been found. So there's one more. And so the police go back into Margaret's room and they pull back a curtain, which looks like a cupboard. But in fact, there's another bedroom. And in that room, they find Stephen Bay. There's obviously been a huge fight in this room. Stephen has got out of bed and has fought with the gunman. There's furniture everywhere. Things are knocked over. So the police now have their five bodies. So if there was a gunman in the house going from room to room, how was that not heard by the family members that were still to come? Well, it wasn't heard because the rifle had a silencer. And although it makes a soft sort of sound, it wouldn't have been loud enough to wake everyone up. It sounds fairly thought out. Like with crimes of passion, they're in the moment, not typically planned. But to think this through to the point of adding a silencer, it's an interesting piece of evidence. Yes, it's a good point. I think the police were inclined to this theory initially. And that theory was that Robin had essentially lost it and had taken his frustration or his mental state out on the family by taking David's gun, because it was David's gun, from the cupboard and going around and shooting the family. The only problem with that was it didn't look like some madman going around shooting everyone. It looked as though if Robin was the killer, he had waited, he'd had a a fairly normal night, got up uh, at his usual time when David was out in his paper room. Obviously, the plan was to do this very quietly and clinically and shoot the family while they were asleep and not conscious. I guess people that uh, have lost their minds can come up with a plan, but it didn't really fit with that person who snaps, who decides to kill everyone and then end it all. Because that was the theory. That was one theory. Robin had killed everyone and then killed himself. David was the only surviving member of the family. How did he say that morning had unfolded for him? His story was that he'd got home and found the family and that he had then rung the police. Again, there were problems with that story. Firstly, he didn't ring the police for about 20 to 25 minutes. So the question was always, what did he do in that 20 to 25 minutes? Why didn't he call the police immediately? For instance, if you or I came home and we found family members dead or with shot gunshot wounds, the immediate reaction would be to call someone for help. Anyway, David didn't do that. He waited 20 to 25 minutes. The other thing is that he initially told the police in his phone call that the family were all dead. And he stayed on the line with another call taker, sort of kept them talking. And he told her that he had come home and found his family, all his family dead. Now, within a very short time, when the police interviewed him at the police station about midday, he had changed that story. And he told the police that he had only seen his mum and his dad. So he wasn't sure who else had died. But he did say that he had seen the his mum and his dad, in his first statement to the police. What were the main pieces of evidence that were found in the home? So in the home, there was the rifle, which was a twenty-two rifle with the silencer. There was blood all over the house. Robin was wearing sort of tracksuit pants, and there was blood on the tracksuit pants. There was bullets scattered around the house. The place where there was the most evidence was Stephen's room. So the killer had the fight with Stephen. So you'd think the killer would have left some evidence behind. Now, there was one crucial bit of evidence which initially looked very damaging to David, and I think it still remains very damaging, and that was a lens. So a lens from a pair of spectacles was found underneath some material in Stephen's room. Now, the lens belonged to a pair of glasses that were found in David's room, but there were no fingerprints on them. There were no biological material on it. 
Um, it's quite possible that if the killer was wearing those glasses, they were knocked off in the fight. But on the other hand, you know, maybe that lens was there through a perfectly innocent explanation, through some perfectly innocent way. Although David never said anything about them. He never explained what that lens was doing in Stephen's room. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Gia Moylan. I'm speaking with Martin Van Bainen, author of Black Hands Inside the Bain Family Murders. After attending the scene, seeing the bodies and David in the state that he was, what were the initial suspicions of police? The initial suspicion was that Robin was the killer. He was found in the lounge with the gun right next to him. He looked as though he'd shot himself and it sort of fitted the scenario in some ways. And that would have been easy for the police because they would have had a murder-suicide. It would have been an investigation by the coroner. They wouldn't have been under any pressure to prepare evidence for a trial. The whole thing would have been a lot simpler. But after a while, they became more and more suspicious of David. One of the things that made them suspicious was some injuries on David's face and chest. And he also had a little scuff on his knee, which was very similar to some of the scuff injuries on Stephen. Those were the things that really made the police start to look very closely at David. One of the other reasons was David's behaviour. He was behaving very strangely. He didn't seem to show a lot of grief or he didn't seem to be mourning. He was staying with family who were surprised about his healthy appetite. He was making jokes. Anyway, all this started to worry the police, the injuries. They also found David's fingerprints on the rifle stock. So that was a big worry. It was another bit of evidence that didn't look good for him. You'd have to explain it in some way. I mean, he could have said, well, I went around the house, I touched so-and-so, I touched this, and then I touched the rifle, I put my bloody fingerprints on it. But he never said that. Now, if I take you through to the lounge where Robin was found on the floor with the gun beside him, he was beside some curtains. Now, if you open the curtains, you were in a little alcove where there was a computer. And the computer, when the police went in there, the computer was on, and there was a message on the screen, and it said, sorry, you are the only one who deserved to stay, suggesting that Robin, before he shot himself, thought he should send a message to David, the sole survivor, saying that he was sorry. Well, that seems like a suicide note from Robin. Why is that something that casts suspicion on David? Well, there were two things. One was that it was a strange note. If Robin was wanting to leave a suicide note, why didn't he just write something? Why would he wait for the computer to warm up? Because this was a really old-fashioned computer. Why would he wait the 40 seconds for the computer to wait up, for the program to load and all that sort of stuff? So it just seemed a bit strange. Robin was, interestingly, a bit of a computer buff. And he was way ahead of his time as a teacher in introducing computers into the classroom. So in some ways, it sort of made sense. Well, why wouldn't he? You know, he knew how to operate the computer. But if you wanted to spear David or if you wanted to point suspicion away from David, why not just write a letter in his own handwriting saying why he'd done it? Anyway, so he had the fingerprints, they had the lens, David's behaviour, they had the change of his statements, all those factors combined to make them think David was the culprit. The killings happened on the Monday. By the Friday, the police were ready to charge and arrest David. So David is really cemented as the main suspect. What did police say might be the motivation for the crime? The motivation for the crime was always the big question. You could understand... Robin's motivation, almost. His life was definitely on a downward trend. Uh, He was estranged from Margaret, living in a caravan, probably struggling a bit at school, although he was very well thought of by the school of which he was principal. He loved his job. He loved the kids. He was frustrated in that he wasn't progressing, and he thought he was worth more than a little country school where he was teaching. 
but you could understand how he might have reached the end of his tether. If you wanted to come up with a motivation for David, you'd have to consider that he was an odd guy. I don't think there's any question about that. He didn't seem to have many friends. He was still doing a paper run at the age of 22. He'd had a number of failures. He failed at university, although he was starting again. He didn't seem to be able to stick to much. He did do some formal singing lessons. So he had some quite big ambitions. And so he had his whole life ahead of him. So why would he do something like that? It seemed very strange. I mean, I can think of a hundred reasons why David might want to kill his family. It might have simply been that he wanted to clear the way so he could start his life, get rid of the family that he felt were a millstone around his neck. He was extremely close to his mother. He may have felt betrayed by her. Anyway, so there's no question that David was sane. The psychiatrist all said that he didn't show any psychiatric disorder or personality disorder. So again, yeah, you were left guessing about what could have motivated him if he was indeed the killer. So David's arrested without a motive, but with what seemed to be some fairly strong evidence against him. What happened with the court case? He was initially tried for the murder of the family in 1995. That's a year after the murders and was found guilty. Then eventually, after a lot of legal manoeuvres and so forth, his convictions were quashed and he was granted a new trial. And he was released from prison in 2007. And then in 2009, there was a new trial in the High Court. On what grounds did they grant that new trial? So the defence went to the Privy Council with a whole lot of evidence and reports that suggested the evidence provided to the first jury was not as clear-cut as made out by the Crown. So they said that if you put all these together, it's been a miscarriage of justice. And they were things like the motor foot robin. Turned out that some of the blood tests weren't as bulletproof as they could have been. There were a number of things like that. They also had some evidence that footprints found in the house were Robin's footprints. Now, if they were Robin's footprints, he had to be the killer because Crown scenario just didn't allow for Robin to be in the place where the footprints put him. Then they had some material about the computer. Now, this is a really complex area, but the computer was turned on at a particular time, and the defence was that at the time the computer was turned on, David was actually outside, that he was seen to be outside. So that gave him an alibi. There were a number of points like this. I think there were nine points in all that the defence said, if you add them all up, that the conviction is unsafe. And the Privy Council agreed, essentially, and said the way the case is shaping up suggests that there should be a new trial. You mentioned Robin's motive just before. So we discussed that he was having a hard time in his marriage and was kind of at the end of his tether But there was another element that became a key argument in the second trial. What did the defence claim was Robin's motive this time around? There was quite a bit of evidence that Laniette, the 18-year-old daughter, had been telling people that Robin had molested her as she was growing up and still continued to do so. So she told various people, and I won't go into all of them, but that Her father had sexually abused her and that she was going to go home on the weekend before the family were killed and get it all out in the open. She was going to take the lid off it and tell everyone that she'd been abused by her father and maybe others. That provided the motivation for Robin. That, the defence said, was why Robin had lost it. It snapped. Not only was his life in disarray, but... Now he would be seen as a paedophile or a as a terrible father and he couldn't face it. So he, he thought, well, I'll shoot the family, shoot myself. That second trial ended in David's acquittal on all charges. What has his life looked like since then? It's fair to say that David keeps a very low profile. We know that his wife is a teacher and... Since the trial in 2009, he married the daughter of one of his strongest supporters. And they've now got two children, maybe three children. 
and they live in the North Island somewhere and his wife is a teacher and I think she teaches at the local school and David is the house husband. David did receive a sum of money from the government, not as compensation but as a restitution for some of the money he had spent, the compensation proceedings and that sort of thing. Now this case is highly controversial in New Zealand and quite well known around the globe, really. Why do you think it's captured so much attention? David managed to get a number of supporters who certainly publicised his arguments and he got a lot of support. So that has generated a pretty high profile for this case. But let's face it, it was always going to be a high profile, very sensational case. It's just got so many elements. It's such a classic whodunit without sounding too heartless about it. We've got a case where one of two people has to be the killer. It can't be anyone else. It's either got to be David or it's got to be Robin. That's the equation. So you can line up your arguments depending on who you're going to back. Also, I think a lot of people who feel the police need to be put in their place would find in David a flag bearer, someone who was the subject of a huge injustice. They're the main reasons why this case just won't go away. It's become such a part of New Zealand culture. People still talk about David Bain's jerseys. There are still jokes about the Bain case. Finally, I wanted to ask, do you think there will ever be justice or closure for the Bain family? It would be fantastic if we could solve this case. We could say, finally, who killed the five members of the Bain family? First of all, for them, it would be great for their memory that we would know what exactly happened. We'd get to the truth. And it would also be a blessing to the family to know who actually did it. David had a large extended family, and they have to live with this every day. And every time this case crops up in the media, they have to think about the great loss that the extended family experienced. And that can't be easy. And it's something that I guess all families look with when they have a tragedy like this. It doesn't go away. However, I think it would help everyone if we knew who did it. If we could say conclusively that it was either Robin or David. Unfortunately, I don't think that's ever going to happen unless there's a major development. And that is the frustrating thing about this case, is that you can go through this evidence with a fine tooth comb thinking you'll get the answer and you are not going to persuade everyone. I think I did in my book, Black Hands, I did go through all the evidence, mainly as an exercise to see if I could solve the crime. And in my own humble view, and I say this with <laughs> with all modesty, I think I did actually solve it, but other people will disagree. So I don't think we'll ever come up with evidence which will show categorically, indisputably, that this person killed the Bain family. So we're going to have to live with that. And I think a lot of crimes, a lot of these big murder cases, based on circumstantial evidence, always leave doubts. They always leave doubts. And although crime novels like to tie things up with a nice bow and everything's solved, life's not like that. It's just a bit messy. You can deduce the correct answer from the evidence, but that is only my opinion. And just like everything I've said in this interview is my opinion, If you spoke to one of David's supporters, they would probably come up with quite a convincing case that I am totally wrong. But I think in the end, sadly, we have to accept that we will never know for sure. Thanks to our guest, Martin Van Bainen, for assisting us to tell the Bain family's story. Martin is an award-winning journalist who's covered the Bain story closely for decades. His 2017 podcast, Black Hands, topped the charts in New Zealand and around the world and has been downloaded more than 5 million times. His book by the same name brings the story completely up to date, exploring the case from start to finish to try and finally answer the question, who was the killer? You can find a link to Martin's book and podcast in our show description. 
This episode of True Crime Conversations was hosted and produced by me, Gia Moylan, with sound design by Rihanna Mooney. If you have a case you'd like us to cover next, you can email us at truecrimeatmamamia.com.au or join our online community. Just search True Crime Conversations on Facebook and make a request to join.